You're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast hosted by Matt Franks and Zach Bechtold. We hope you enjoy this week's show and you can find out more about us by going online at beardedtheologians.com where you can pick up a few t-shirts, listen to a few old episodes, and find ways that you can connect with us. Thank you for listening. You're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast hosted by Matt Franks and Zach Bechtold. So uh, this week on the podcast, uh, we uh, are jumping back into the Gospel of John after having an amazing interview uh, with uh, Bishop Ken Carter. Uh, I would encourage you to go back and listen to that. Like literally, I texted Zach after we were done. I was like, was your heart not strangely warmed after listening to her talking Absolutely. One of my Uh, favorite interviews we've done in eight years. Definitely top top five for sure. Uh, But we're jumping back into the Gospel of John, and we're going to look at John uh, chapter 20, verses 24, uh, till when Zach stops. And so, yeah. Zach, uh, go ahead and jump in on that. Certainly. Um, so just as a refresher, two weeks ago when we were here, or last time we talked about John's Gospel, we talked about Jesus um, appearing to the disciples um, and what that was like in the upper room. And we're continuing on today with uh, Jesus appearing to Thomas. So John chapter 20 verses 24 through 29 is where I'll stop. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the 12, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers in the wounds left by the nails and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. And he said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. And so, Matt, when you hear this familiar story of of Thomas, what really jumps out? What jumps out to you here? So, you know, you and I both use the Wesley Study Bible mm-hmm. uh, pretty, pretty faithfully. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, what was interesting is I don't know if you have yours in front of you, but if you I notice, do. it says instead of doubting Thomas, a better title would be absent Thomas. Mm. Uh, and, and, and it literally lays out, it says, if Thomas had been present on the earlier occasion, when Jesus appeared to the disciples, he would have never had made uh, his original statement uh, of vigorous denial. Uh, we don't know why Thomas was absent previously. Uh, and then yada, yada, yada. But I kind of like that. Like how many times have mm-hmm. you been in a space where somebody says something and you're like, well, ah, uh, like, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, and it's not an issue of doubt. It's just an issue of that. They didn't have all the information. Um, mm-hmm. Or they didn't, they weren't aware of what was happening because maybe they'd been gone or maybe mm-hmm. uh, they weren't con- as connected as we, you know, uh, as thought. And here you have Thomas, like literally like it's eight days uh, and, and and eight days after the event. And it's just like, like I, I, you and I talk about this a lot. That it's not doubting Thomas isn't a good word. Mm-hmm. Um because it even then makes, and it has, there's been a generation of people that have been raised that doubt is bad. Right. And you're now seeing this resurgence, this, this reclamation of the word doubt being good. I mean, Adam Hamilton has a new book on doubt. Uh, he still won't answer our uh, emails about coming on the podcast. And so I doubt that he exists. <laughs> uh, and then um, Brian McLaren uh, has, an, has yeah. a good book out on doubt. It's becoming the norm to say, to give space to that, that doubting mm-hmm. is okay. And I, and I, and, and I really try to say, you know, it's okay if you doubt these things, like this is, this is not as important as you think it is, whatever it may be for a person, but to really mm-hmm. give that space for doubt is something I think was lost in the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, because in some mindsets to doubt means you don't have the faith, whereas really it's quite opposite in my opinion. Right. What about you, I, I, I have always framed uh, this story of Thomas around, um, he get, you said it, he gets a bad rap around doubt. Uh, and we call him Doubting Thomas, and we really shouldn't. We really should call him Faithful Thomas. I, I like the, the idea of absent Thomas. He just wasn't there. Uh, he, he missed the big thing. And 
FOMO is real, right? Like the fear of missing out when, when we go places and we come back home, we're like, Oh my God, that was so awesome. It's easy for the people that were there to be like, was it really though? Um, <laughs> you know, just because yeah. we hold on to some of that anxiety and tension of why well, I wanted to be there. And I feel like that's where Thomas is here. Like, well, dang it. I wasn't there. But if we back up into the empty tomb stories and, uh, the the Marys and the women run back to the upper room and they tell Peter and the guys like, hey, the tomb is empty and they don't believe them, right? They have to go and run and see for themselves. And once they see the tomb is empty, they kind of hang their heads and go back in disbelief, right? Like there are the same feelings there with the other disciples at the empty tomb as we find here with Thomas saying, I wasn't there. I want to see him. And I, I think that request of, I want to put my, I, I want to touch the holes in his hands and put my hand in his side isn't so that I will believe. It's, I, I want to have the experience to touch Jesus once again. Uh, you guys are saying he's back. The last time I saw him, he didn't look like he was coming <laughs> back. And I, I, I want to, this is how I want to see, right? Like Thomas is yearning for the tangible uh, in his faith, in in my opinion of, uh, we all do that, right? Like I, I won't see it or, you know, I won't believe it until I see it, right? Unless I can touch it, I won't believe. We, we do that about uh, through our faith all the time. Um, and to, I, to me, Thomas's response is as faithful as anybody else is yearning for something bigger than himself, yearning for the hope that Jesus has returned. And he wants the privilege and the opportunity to simply uh, to touch Jesus once again, to be present with him once again, rather than it being a hard black and white line of, I won't believe until I, I physically touch Jesus. I think it's the reassurance that Jesus is actually back. Uh, and, and Thomas reaching for something bigger than he is and bigger than he understands but purely because think, of the circumstances of reality, right? Like it's right. a big deal. But I also think too, that Jesus kind of perpetuates, um, the, the idea of doubting. And, mm -hmm. and here's where he says, uh, he said to Thomas, and this is verse 27, mm -hmm. then he said to Thomas, put your hand or put your finger here, mm -hmm. look at my hands. And then put your hand into my side. No more disbelief than believe. Mm -hmm. Like, I can see where, like, how doubt could be used uh, to, in the negative sense. That, mm -hmm. and, but there are people who need that tangible. Like, I, I, I totally believe in that. Like, and you and I have seen that time and time again, where maybe somebody didn't like the church, but maybe they didn't have a great church experience. And so, right. you know, we offer that experience like, hey, come and see. Uh, I know like a few months ago, I had somebody come after me uh, online and say, you know, I'm, I, you know, don't believe in the Bible and all these things. And so like, you've never stepped foot in, the, in my church. How do you know what we believe? You've never watched this online. Like, how do you know what what I do? Um, and, and I think that there's a difference between being, um, disinformed or misinformed and a difference in doubt. Mm -hmm. And that in this case, Thomas is misinformed that, and, and two, he's probably considering the source. He probably isn't really believing that this actually happened. Sure. Uh, that he's not here, that he is risen. Like, mm -hmm. I get that. I also understand the need to touch as someone who does, like I wouldn't, I need to see it to believe it. Uh, um, and I think that in order for us to really lean into the idea that, that doubting is a part of our faith, it allows us to grow because it's, it helps us stretch, uh, stretch out, uh, uh, you know, really the growth of that and, mm -hmm. I think to doubt is a roadblock for growth because we want, we don't want to, we, we don't want to think that what we first thought was wrong. Right. Well, and, and I think that's what we learn from Thomas here in the faithful uh, in in the faithful doubt, Thomas isn't willing just to take the other disciples word for it, that Jesus has returned. He 
wants to see for himself, right? Like he's asking the right questions. He's not just blindly following in faith. It's, I want to see too. I want to be present for this. Um, and I, I think we do that far too often in our own uh, faith journeys as clergy, as lay people, as everybody in between. Uh, we just, whatever we hear from the person speaking, we kind of take that as gospel truth and move on and don't ask enough questions or haven't had permission to ask enough questions and dig into it and have healthy conversation and have healthy disagreement and have healthy doubt, and have healthy um, ways in which we strengthen our faith. We just hear it and go, yeah, okay, must must be true. They they said it. Um, and yet when things don't sit well or sit differently and we do have questions, we should, it, it's not always doubt, right? Like doubt's part of it. Um, but questioning, asking the questions, trying to actually see what it what is actually before us as faithful, it's what we should be doing, right? Right. Um, and and I think Thomas is I, I just think he leads the way for the permission to do that. Otherwise, I don't think Jesus would have been like, okay, Thomas, touch my hands, <laughs> right? Okay, Thomas, here's the thing. He would have just been like, what are you doing? <laughs> Ye of little faith, get out of here. Uh, and yet he welcomes him in into, um, into the tangible, into seeing for himself, and, and really calls him to go back out and share that, share what you've seen. Um, share how you've seen it and experienced it. Well, and that's why Jesus is very clear at the end. You know, mm-hmm. uh, do you believe because you see me? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, happy are those who don't see me and yet believe. He's John Cena. He's he's John Cena in the <laughs> uh, the Thomas there, right? Uh, well, he, uh, <laughs> he he's digging back into the Beatitudes, right? Yes. Like, happy are those, blessed are those who who don't have to do this, and yet we know it's a thing. Yeah. Well, and and you know the, I think too that when we are, when we're in that space, asking mm-hmm. ourselves what what do I need to to, to discover or to grow or to. Uh, what what is God saying to me here in this moment? I think that can help us remove some of the fear that we may have that comes mm-hmm. with it being in those spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think too that to giving ourselves permission to say mm-hmm. that doubt is okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know both of us grew up in a space where you know you didn't doubt. Like if you doubted, that means you didn't have enough faith. Right. Um, and so I think that when we dive into that we can uh we can learn a little more and grow a little more actually mm-hmm. uh for uh to just say it's okay like mm-hmm. and you know methods have this terminology that we use every so often called this holy mystery like mm-hmm. there are some things we just have to admit that are are a holy mystery right and so how are we going to live that out in our daily lives like i think that that's something to to discern mm-hmm. well and i think that's what this story of thomas does for me is it's permission giving right uh, one permission giving to seek and to search um, for something more, but it's also a a very stark reminder for for me um, that people are in different places. People need different things. People need to hear and see uh, things differently, um, and that the way that we live out the gospel, the way that we present it in our churches and in our communities, um, there's a fullness to it, right? And it's really easy to get frustrated when people don't get it. Uh, and yet we need to give permission. Uh, remember to give permission to people that it's okay where you are. And we're all in different places and we've all had different experiences. And how do we walk this journey together um, so that you do so that you do fully experience Christ, so that you do fully experience God's love and grace um, rather than taking for granted of, well, I've been there why aren't you there yet? Right. Why haven't you caught up? And I, I think, I think the church gets stuck in that quite a bit um, as, on a variety of things of well, why don't you just understand? Well, people aren't always in the same place. And so let's, or why can't you believe the same way that I do? Right. Um, right. So, yeah. And so I do, I think Thomas gives us permission for that. Uh, and a, and a good reminder of, we're in different places. He was quite literally in a different place than the the rest of the disciples, right? Uh, He was absent, you know? 
when when we bring the good news to people, we got to remember sometimes they're absent uh, or they've been absent in their life and leave room for grace and the Holy Spirit to wear it, right? Yeah. And I, I think, too, it's about saying it's okay that you didn't have that. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, you and I probably encounter this when it comes to infant baptism, mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. there are people who were baptized okay. in infants that don't remember their baptism. So yeah. when we do that, how do you... How do you talk about that? Now, granted, if they've been baptized in the last 10 years, they should probably have some kind of picture or yeah. video about it because that's the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. But they're a bulk of our people. That's not a thing for them. And so yeah. how do we uh, how do we help them remember that when they don't remember it? And mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, um, just being patient and caring is is key. Mm hmm. So, Zach, as uh, we continue on, uh, where have you seen God at work in the last few weeks since it's been two weeks? It has been. Um, you know, kind of like you, I'm sure you're starting, it, we're getting the spring snow, right? We're, we're having 60 degree days and then having uh, two or three inches or six inches of snow, uh, you know, the next day. But I, that's where I'm beginning to see just in the changing of the seasons, um, as we head towards Pentecost and just, I mean, truly Bozeman turns into a different place in the summer. Um, the traffic's already starting to pick up. We're starting to see an influx in, uh, out of towners and visitors and vacationers and things. And, um, we're also starting to see people in our congregation and community vacate, whether that's camping on the weekends or, you know, just doing the things that they can do in this part of the world. And uh, I love that. I love that changing of the seasons and seeing where people find joy uh, and hope as as spring and summer kind of set in. And, you know, it, there's just a different vibe in Bozeman and in Montana in general when when spring comes around, especially after a, a weird winter. And um, I don't know, I'm just seeing kind of people be excited and hopeful, but also just enjoy themselves um and enjoy uh just the little things in life like getting to wear shorts and go out on walks again and hear the birds i i'm really you know i'm big on the fullness of creation and uh for folks who can't play in the winter that that becomes a hard time and so to see that kind of come back around and that appreciation for uh the beauty that surrounds us and creation that surrounds us is pretty cool and see them starting to put those pieces together right like they're answering this question and gosh, I'm seeing God and in, in the birds, right. And the, and the blooms and you know, all of the things. So I, I, uh, I love that. It makes me happy. What about, what about you? You know, um, we definitely are in the midst of a revival here and that's been really great. So as we reflect upon our 150 year history of the church mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we had an event last Wednesday and I'm not gonna lie. Like it, we, I was not, I uh, was thinking, oh, this will be a small event. We won't have a whole lot of people. Uh, but then all of a sudden, over 103 people showed up, and it was amazing. It was a great time. And uh, it just gave a sense of we're doing the right things, and things are moving in a better direction. And we're starting to see newer people, and uh, we're having more people engaging in a way that hasn't been in a while. And uh, that's just been very, very life-giving, uh, all things considered. Uh, over the last few years of my life, uh, having that uh, has been a good reminder of just just continue, keep going. You've got mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. uh, I know for me that has definitely been a big uh, motivator uh, in these last uh, last few months. And so it's been just been really cool to, to see that uh, happen. Uh, so, uh, Zach and I probably at some point or another, will talk about general conference. Uh, you know, when stuff starts to happen, we yeah, is there something to talk about, uh, <laughs> nothing's happened just yet. We're recording, uh, on Tuesday morning. And so they haven't even really started, uh, in a way. Um, and so I'm sure we'll have some reflections and stuff. Um, but you know, in all honesty, we have a lot of great content. Um, you know, we've been doing this for eight years now and, uh, we have just some really great listens to listen to, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, would encourage you to go to, to do that. And you can do that through beardedtheologians.com. You can also click to buy stuff as we enter into the mother's father's grandparents day seasons, uh, or even getting a new clergy or, uh, saying yeah. goodbye to a new clergy. Those are great gifts to share as well. 
Uh, we uh, appreciate you and uh, hope you keep listening. And so for the Bearded Theologians, I'm Matt Franks. I'm Zach Bechtold. Thanks for checking us out. I want you to subscribe and like this video and put that thumb, push that thumbs up. Thank you for listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share on all social media outlets. You can check out old episodes and more information at beardedtheologians.com. Thanks for checking us out.